right, we are reconvening our meeting. We were in um, closed session at 5 o'clock, so we will go ahead and reconvene with uh, approval of the agenda. I move the Board of Education approve the agenda as submitted. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as submitted. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. And tonight we have our district strategic plan review. We do this every quarter, just about. So I shall turn it over to the superintendent. All right. So tonight we'll review. It's the first of this year of the 21-22 school year priority initiative update. So keep that in mind as we talk about where we're at uh, with these individual goals. So again, um, the first time we did this a decade or so ago, um, we were pretty much done in October for the year. And I think the board said, well, maybe we need goals that are a little bit more far reaching that, that take tw you know, 12 months or 10 months to accomplish. So, so keep in mind uh, that's uh, when we see the different icons. So these are the priority initiatives accepted by the board last May. Uh, and as we talk about this, there are status updates, check mark means it's completed, uh, green, uh, 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 green circle with an arrow inside of it, uh, it means it's operational, in other words, it's something that we can continue to do, significant process, steady progress, some progress, and some things are canceled, some things we get started on and it just doesn't seem to make sense to continue. So I'll go through these um, after each of the areas if you have a question uh, let me know and I can, can clarify um, I did leave my set on the on my computer so I have a little bit smaller writing so I apologize for some of the reading in advance so student achievement and development the first was to increase student connections uh, through the addition of new varied extracurricular activities with the emphasis on the addition of culturally relevant activities clubs and organizations um, so very little has been done on that at this point. It's at some progress. There's a meeting with student. This is was a goal chosen by students uh, for students, and so we have three or four meetings coming up. The first of which is on November uh, the 11th, and so we'll begin that work. If they're going to write their goal, we're going to empower them to be part of the solution. So how do we connect students to school? We know that our students who are most connected to school do the best, so those who are in uh, sports or music or drama, and so what can we do to connect uh, more students to school through other uh, activities? Uh, number two, focus current and future student programming to meet the unfinished learning needs of students as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, how do we catch the students up after a year of hybrid learning, um, of just a variety of distractions, students who miss school for a variety of reasons. And so a lot of these things you've seen before, but our core plus teachers at the elementary level and interventionists at the middle school and high school work with small groups of students on things that they have missed the previous year. So what standards are they not proficient in? And so not to be uh, misconstrued as students who have necessarily fallen behind. You know, they work with students who are, you know, doing some remediation, catching up. There's some students who are in the middle and some students who are on the high end, but they all have a few holes, and so we're going to plug those holes in, uh, fill those holes in, so that as the students progress, they don't, you know, they have the learning they need at the next level. So that will be a multi-year um, thing and something that we are paying for with the the ESSER money we receive. Um, secondary school completed two days of professional learning around school's MTSS process, so MTSS, multiple tiered system of support. So again, students who need additional support, um, what systems are in place to give that student support uh, in the school? It could be academically, it could be behaviorally, it could be anything that you know, we look at how do we continue to help our students be successful and that answer is a little bit different. Uh, for each student. So it's along the lines of differentiation, if you will. Um, professional learning and curricular offerings continue to support addressing unfinished learning of students. So again, that's our, our biggest focus, sort of, I want to say post-COVID, we're not quite post-COVID yet, but we are getting there every day. Um, so how do we get students who, we have a lot of parents of first and second and fourth and fifth graders, and I guess high school too, who feel like, oh, how are they going to make up for what they missed last year? So how do we do that? systemically um, to keep them uh, on track and knowing that we're not going to do it all in one year. Um, that's why we received the, the federal funding for those 
types of learning opportunities for a couple of years. Uh, number three, enhance teaching strategies to support student voice and choice in coursework while delivering curricular content that connects with student experiences and interests. Um, so again, we're in that early phase of pulling in that data. Instructional rounds at Hempstead in, in September focused on gathering baseline classroom data. Um, you know, it, it's the age old, how much did the teacher talk versus how much did the student talk? What is that interaction? It's not the sit and get like you're doing tonight, unfortunately, <laughs> where the teacher just talks at them for 48 minutes, but what is the component by which the students either work together or ask questions or do a project um, so that you know, research shows that's better teaching and better learning. Um, you know we've been focused on employability skills. Um, so we have 12 high school students in the new employability skills with job shadowing class with um, completion of four four-hour job shadows. So getting students out into the world of work so they see what happens once they graduate. Um, elementary principals and instructional coaches as well as math and English language arts content leaders participated in differentiated professional learning. Um, so again, what is it? It's about individualizing the teaching for the students because they all learn um, differently. Um, district staff participate in the state of Iowa 20 days, 21 day phase on small group models to develop differentiated student work with opportunities for choice in independent and connected activities. So again, if you're going to learn whether it's art class or math class, English class, giving some choice in um, the, the standards don't stay, change, the learning doesn't change, but how they learn that um, can be individualized or small, put into small groups so students have a, the best opportunity to learn the material that's being shared. Number four, develop a continuum of social, emotional, and behavioral supports uh, through the multi-tiered systems of support. So again, same thing. So behavior, academically, we do see um, Students who are struggling, I think the paper one day this week talked about the number of police calls uh, dealing with adults uh, with, with uh, brain health issues. Well, we see that same thing in, in our schools. And so how are we going to address uh, those students, work with families, work with parents to make sure that we're kind of you know, working together to, to help their students uh, be in a position where they can learn? I mean, our job is to teach, and sometimes we have to help them um, social, emotionally. Um, Second step, universal tiered social emotional curriculum is being piloted at some of our elementary schools. Uh, social academic emotional behavior risk screener is providing new data point. Again, at some schools, they're piloting that. Um, screener results and other student data being used to help build building level teams plan for individual student grade level and building wide social, emotional, and behavioral health needs. So again, it's about understanding where our students are. It's not our job to do all of that, but it is our job to uh, recognize that it does impact with some students their education. And so, how do we work again with families? This isn't a, you know this is working with families to ensure that um, students have an opportunity to be academically successful. All right, uh, number five: educate and coach students regarding various career pathways while increasing opportunities for hands-on career-focused experience. So, this one we talked a little bit about. You'll see that it is. Um, sort of that pro some progress is being made and, and the reality is a lot of progress is being made but when you look at the world as a whole there is so much to do <laughs> that this is probably never going to be something we're completely at because this is connecting students to life post-graduation what are their what are their goals what are their passions what are they interested in and then how do we give them opportunities while they're with us to experience that to get the right education to do and so the, the uh, possibilities are really endless as to what that could mean. So we kind of struggled because we feel like we're doing a lot of work there, but what, based on the total pool of work that could be done there. <laughs> um, so let me just go through what we've got here. Um, so co consultation with Keystone AEA, a professional learning course is being offered to expose teachers to the differentiated careers available in the Dubuque and surrounding areas. So the AEA, and I see, see others, GDDC, can tell you what are the careers that exist, what careers are going to expand, what careers are going to diminish. And so how do we help students see those careers or families see those careers so they can say, hey, I want to be a, uh, and whatever that uh, is, is something that has a strong future versus something that maybe is going away because we want to help them understand that. 
Uh, two Vertex coaches were hired to promote the Vertex initiative to students and support staff and career college readiness efforts. So how do we have somebody at the high school who understands where every student is and tracks that by the time they get to graduation, they've had this opportunity, but also connects with the community. So it might be the, you know, the big employers in town connecting with the John Deere's, or it might be the smaller employers. Um, but how do we connect students with real world work experiences? Since we started putting the Vertex out, I would tell you that our um, uh, emails have been lighting up, uh, mostly uh, uh, David Moller's and, and Mark's with, with companies saying, hey, don't forget about us because work, short, you know, work, worker shortage is real. And so they want to make sure that they're putting their best foot forward to the workforce of tomorrow, which is our high school students, middle school students, while they're still students. So we've had a lot of requests from people to say, hey, how do we participate uh, in that? Uh, uh, because we're, uh, we, you know, we want, we, we're a viable uh, career for kids, and we want to make sure that they know that that's available right here in Dubuque, should they choose that. Four welding registered apprentices are currently working to attain their 2,000 hour competency based certificate for four different businesses. So again, we had the, uh, uh, the young lady come and speak to us um, sometime last year, who was in that program. It's a powerful program. So those young people graduate uh, with a really a desirable skill and an opportunity to make a great living. A new education pathway has been developed with NICC and Clark University who begin next year. So again, young people who are interested in becoming teachers have a pathway to take those classes through the community college and then through Clark so that upon graduation, um, first of all, they've experienced what it might be like to be a teacher and to see if that's something they want to do or not, but also then have had an opportunity to gain a significant number of credits by graduation, therefore shortening the amount of time and therefore the expense of going to college and, be, and still being a teacher. Uh, let's see, where was I at? Uh, at District High School's post-secondary career readiness teams uh, made up of administrators, counselors, and teachers from various content areas are starting to implement uh, guaranteed post-secondary readiness activities that meet the five essential components of the Iowa's individual career and academic planning or ICAP requirements. So again, every student, how do we, we're not telling them what they should want to be. We're not they're in charge of the vision. They're in charge of what their passion is, what do they want to do post-graduation. Our job is to fill in those blanks and give them an opportunity to, to move forward with uh, or be in a good place to actually achieve that. All right, number six, implement and evaluate a virtual education program for the 21-22 school year for students who desire this option and can be successful at it. So, that one better be pretty far along because we've been doing it since the first day of school. So basically all that says is that we'll have an online school available um, first through 12th grade. Um, virtual learning um, has been serving 75 students at the elementary level. Teachers are online. They're working from a trailer uh, at Sageville. And so the trailer is, is divided into small office slash classrooms and they broadcast from there to the students who've chosen to stay at home. Uh, Ingenuity platform continues to be used for grades 6 through 12. Uh, for select courses, several students are successfully live streaming into secondary classrooms at both high schools. So in some classes, we have to live stream versus do the Ingenuity just because of the content uh, that's being shared. And gifted and talented programming is being delivered virtually and in person with creative scheduling. So again, because a student chooses to be online doesn't mean that we don't still offer them opportunities like gifted and talented so that they can maximize that uh, that time, that gift, or that talent. Number seven, develop new and enhance um, current computer science learning opportunities and coursework in high school, middle school, and the elementary schools. So we note that a significant portion of our young people will work in a very tech-rich environment. Maybe not all, but many. So what are we doing to prepare them for that and help them understand next steps? Coding coursework has been implemented in all fourth and fifth grade classrooms across the district. Uh, first Lego League teams are underway at five elementary schools at various grades uh, and at one middle school in sixth grade. We're still working on some coaches for those for the for other schools. First tech so so Lego League goes to sixth grade. And then it changes into first tech challenge uh, is ongoing at two middle schools in seventh and eighth grade. That also kind of resorts back to number one. Um, but it is how do we get kids involved in things that are not traditional classroom experiences in, in the technology field. 
Um, the biggest challenge there is recruiting mentors, coaches uh, to oversee those teams because I think a lot of adults don't necessarily feel like they have the skills um, prerequisite to help students in First Lego League or in the uh, First Tech Challenge. But um, we're getting there. First robotic team at a high school level will begin visiting elementary schools in December and visit with fifth graders to do hands-on showcase. So again, we've got this great robotics team at the high school level. How do we get them out showcasing the things that they're doing, all the cool stuff with the, with the robots and the competitions they go to? Again, it's kind of like, you know, you see this in sports and music all the time. You get kids involved early and, and, and you hope they you know, find something that resonates with them and stick with it. And so same same thing with the robotics team. Um, staff to support first competition teams have been moved from volunteer to paid stipend, so that was a significant move. So in the, the, in the Lego League, First Tech Challenge, all those types of things, as opposed to, hey, would you like to do this? We're finding ways to create stipends so that you know, they are paid to do that, um, uh, that activity with students. We'll hope that creates <coughs> some longevity uh, in, in those positions. That's a strong equity move. I appreciate that that's been done. It, it really trying to that look at them as coaches the versus, or, or not only as coaches necessarily, but, but sure. you know, directors or, you know, like we do with all of our other extracurriculars. Um, well, and it's not dependent upon the school's ability to provide that funding. Yeah, that, absolutely. Which is great. Absolutely. Uh, robots have been ordered for all 8th grade exploratory classes for an experience this year with the emphasis on creating integrated classrooms within the exploratory curriculum for the 22-23 school year. The key word there is ordered. Uh, <laughs> you know that anything with technology uh, has a backlog date uh, these days because of the availability of chips and you know anything else. And so uh, we're, I don't know, I haven't heard the latest about when that will be um, when the, we'll, they'll be delivered, but hopefully soon. Okay, moving on to community engagement. Uh, Stan, I got a question. Oh, yep, sorry. I got a question about the, uh, the Vertex coaches. So those are new at, at each one of our high schools. I Correct. And have we? This they're new this fall, then, right? Correct. They're so new as we, within the last couple of weeks. So we haven't had a chance to see if that affects like uh, course enrollment and some of the trade. We have not yet. No, we just. Um, Carlos probably started a couple of weeks ago, okay. and then the other, the one at senior, maybe hasn't even started yet, or just started this week, yeah. so today. That's great. <laughs> so we don't know the outcome yet. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions before I shift gears? All right, community engagement. Reconnect and re-engage families to their school communities following the COVID-19 pandemic. Recognizing this engagement positively impacts school attendance and achievement. So we know that students who are connected to their school outside of the school day tend to do much better academically. We also know that parents who are connected to their school have students who do better academically because again, it becomes a little bit of a, of a family thing. So uh, how do you do that post? We were kind of working pretty hard on that. COVID hit and we basically said stay away. You know, uh, there was just this, this year and a half of, of distance that was created, and so how do we rebuild that? So the first thing is you're all familiar with the mobile registration uh, team stops throughout the community to assist families in registering <laughs> students for school. Uh, they were also taking applications for uh, uh, positions as well. Uh, transportation was identified as a barrier to attendance in our Title I staff, uh, and so we're adding the new loop routes that we, we had talked about, so if there's uh, some chronic absenteeism issues. How are we helping families get to school? It is uh, a two-mile walk boundary means different things in different geographies. You know, if it's flat, and it's different than if you're walking up Loris, for example. Uh, it's different if you've got an opportunity for transportation, in other words, a car versus walking to school. It's different by grade. When you're in first grade, you're probably not walking to school in the winter by yourself. So they need that parent component. So how do we alleviate that through utilizing um, our resources. We had thought about doing vans. The van order time was uh, forever. So we're utilizing um, existing transportation to do that after they're done with their other routes. Um, District is exploring a partnership with the RTA, uh, which is seeking grant funding to support targeted transportation from specific community housing locations uh, needing support. So again, 
is there somebody else in the game? Is it, often these days, I feel like the school district picks up the, the work for everything. Uh, and so how do we help others? And the RTA is working on a grant with, our, with some of the folks here to figure out how transportation that wouldn't be covered under this, the current transportation and the state guidelines could be covered through uh, a different entity that also is in the business of transporting people. Um, elementary schools offered a fall orientation meetings for all students and have offered opportunities for family engagement through outdoor events and or indoor events that are socially distanced. So again, trying to move beyond that, get back into, we've had some uh, uh, school fairs, if you will, some ice cream socials, some just those things that existed sort of pretty easily uh, pre-COVID and how do we get back to doing those things. Uh, as much as we can because we do want our families to be the vital part of our school. Uh, refocus the vision, number nine, refocus the vision and programming for student mentoring following the COVID pandemic, including updated training and protocols for community business mentors. <coughs> Again, families that are connected to school, kids that are connected to school, and then mentoring is um, really important for our students. You know, kids who, young people who have connection with adults, uh, oftentimes at home, sometimes not. How do we create mentoring opportunities? Um, so data was collected from schools to identify existing mentors and district training sessions were held with these mentors who are matched by the school. So how do we know that that's a good fit? How do we know they're doing the right mentoring activities? Programming is restarting uh, and mentors are returning to meet with students in person. So both our mentoring program, but also we met with the Dream Center. They're going to have their mentor, their coaches, which are sort of mentors, back in our school starting next Monday. So getting reconnected um, with those entities that also provide mentoring. Um, all ongoing work includes reviewing mentoring curriculum, school-specific mentor training, and recruitment of new community and business mentors. So how do we make sure that every student who wants or needs a mentor has a strong mentor to, to, to work with them? Uh, number 10, systematize the process for cultivating and sustaining school business partnerships to support career opportunities through the Vertex Initiative. So again, that's a two-way street, and we've had a lot of folks reaching out to us saying, hey, we'd like to participate in that because they want to make sure their business uh, or their skill set is represented. Vertex team continues to build partnerships with their businesses in collaboration with its partners, uh, NICC, Dubuque Air Labor Management, Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. So all the places where business leaders congregate to discuss either the current uh, situation in the county or the future situation that we can be a part of, particularly those future. We've got uh, 800 graduates every year who are looking for that next step in life, whether that's to go to college, whether to go to two-year school, whether to go right into a trade program. And so making sure that and those businesses are well aware that you know the talent um, drain or the brain drain you hear about, that a lot of that can be overcome by making sure our students are understand what opportunities exist locally. Uh, work -based learning, a work-based learning database was launched in October, allowing for the team to continue to build and organize business partners. Uh, database will also allow staff to track student experiences systemic, systematically to allow for better tracking and reporting of data to support program development. So if we're going to get to 100% of our students having a college or career ready experience, we need to have a system in place to collect that data. And ultimately, we would like to see them have both, right? Both a college and a career, so that kind of helps them make that choice without sort of tracking them one way or the other. But we have to start where we have to start. Stay on the focus, uh, as I read this, on uh, school business partnerships here seems to be the CTE focus at the high school level. Are I would say at the high school level, not necessarily the CTE focus. Okay. Some of the early successes are CTE, okay. but the work, so like, for example, like the, the teaching program through, through NICC. So okay. it is trying to recognize there's this big, you know, if you use one employer, like you use a, a manufacturer, there's everything from the engineer to the, who designs it, to the drafts person, to the, to the hands-on, so how do we make all of those opportunities available for kids? But you're right, the early successes have been in the CTE. Are we continuing to <clears throat> nurture school business partnerships at all levels, or is it sort of reduced to high school? So this year the focus is on high school and late middle school. Okay. But 
we do need to drive that down much earlier yes. um, in successive priority initiatives to say what do we right. do? You know, because a lot of our kids, you know, they start to think about. You know, they're exposed to, to different careers at, at really young ages or different, you know, things that they're interested in. So we, we need to get there, but the focus right now is on the college and career portion of our graduates. So trying to start at the higher levels and work backwards, if you will. Okay. But you would look forward in seeing it at all levels? Yeah, I mean, focus? obviously that would be probably a recommendation that would come, and if the board says, yeah, that's one that should be one of our prior initiatives, we would want a, you know, the idea is if we start too young, then we lose the graduates. So we want to start sure. with the closest to graduation and work backwards so that we get um, coverage of all of our current students. Sure. Thank you. Stan, do we still have junior achievement in our mm -hmm. schools? Yep. In fact, the junior achievement at the elementary school has expanded greatly this year. Okay. Greatly. Yep. And I would just add to Nancy's point. While it's not a priority, raw priority initiative, there is still work happening on the school business level partnerships at the elementary level and some middle school in terms of reassessing the status of those partnerships, okay. um, continuing to in, in this kind of after this gap um, to reassess right. those to look at the baseline and then to do outreach and continue that. So that, that work hasn't stopped. Okay. Um, but this priority initiative, of course, is, is focused around the Vertex initiative. Sure. But there is still work happening in that area. Good. So as a district, we're still interested in having healthy, active school business partnerships at all levels in all schools. Absolutely. And that's mm -hmm. continuing to happen. Um, Good. But when it and comes to the sort of career exposure sure. piece, sure. I think that's the piece yeah. I was talking about, like where we have to work. But as far as having that connection... You know, hy Vee has been a great business partner for many of our buildings, and, and it's, a, it's mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily career-focused, but it is how can that business help, and hopefully how can that school help Jay, that business. Right, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, where were we? Effective? I'll wait for my Sorry, I'm cold. There's cold air blowing on me. Yeah, there's <laughs> something. Better it off. Now we need air. Mike's got it fixed. All right, let's well, see if that works. Going. Effective. <laughs> Can you at least turn the slide for me, Mike? All right, effective resource management. Of course, all of these things are only possible if our resources are um, aligned with what our goals are. So. Continue to plan for input process for creating operational efficiencies across district facilities. Research is currently being conducted on building efficiencies and will be part of a forthcoming strategic planning conversation. So, how, you know, we're down students in the last couple of years, yep. as you, you are all aware, and so where are those efficiencies? Where do we save money with the number and locations of buildings, and then how did those resources get reprioritized to so all the other things we're trying to do? So um, that's uh, coming up probably to December, January to have a work session around what does that look like? Or what could it look like? I don't, we won't probably answer all questions in one meeting, but at least start that, there's, have some next step in that conversation. Plan for maximize funds available through the American Rescue Plan to ensure the most significant impact on student success. As you know, we talked about in the fall, CFT developed a comprehensive plan which includes stakeholder input to maximize the um, American Rescue Plan funds to support student success in most needed areas. Plan focused on social emotional brain health, unfinished learning, addressing learning loss, addressing the access gap, student services, community family engagement, and operational support. So we know that through a survey of our members, the largest, um, request from parents was that first one, social, emotional, learning, brain health. That was the largest concern of our parents, and we surveyed all of our parents and had 18, I don't want to make up a number, but I think it was like 1,800 responses. It was a high response rate for a survey, and by far the largest concern of parents was, is my student doing okay um, because of the pandemic, for other reasons too, but certainly the pandemic played a role in that. So we put significant resources in that. Um, number 13, enhanced collaboration across the districts for the implementation of Microsoft Teams. And so we were using Zoom last year. We've transitioned to Teams. 
Um, it started as a, uh, a way to have meetings or classes or share information during a time when we didn't know if it was safe to be together or not. And so we've transitioned to Microsoft Teams. And I tell you, we have more frequent meetings um, now because people don't have travel time. They don't have to get in a car and come to the forum. We can meet uh, via Teams. So Microsoft Teams has been launched district-wide. Uh, training has been delivered to all 19 technology coaches because they're using it in the building as well. So I hope they have to be there to support uh, their students and staff. Uh, virtual parent-teacher conferences are being um, used through this platform um, this week. So for those who choose a virtual option for their parent-teacher conferences, they'll use that through Teams. It's, um, it's been pretty, it's an effective tool. It's easy to use. Um, additional features of the continuing, continually expanding platform will continue to be rolled out. So we're going to stick with Teams for a while and, and utilize that. We use this uh, the urban education districts, the superintendents used to meet two to three times a year. I had to drive to Des Moines, Sioux City drove to Des Moines, Dubuque drove to Des Moines, and now we meet monthly for an hour and a half uh, on a Teams meeting, and so everybody wins. I save six hours of driving and attend a meeting that's more effective. Uh, employee excellence, provide professional learning and growth opportunities for administrators aligned with the launch of the new Iowa leadership standards. So we talked about that previously. There are new leadership standards required by the state. So those 10 standards um, are by the, the manner in which the superintendent is evaluated, all administrators are evaluated, and so there are 10 standards. And so we did uh, a couple of professional development <coughs> sessions with those. It's a 15-hour training. Denise Shears, uh, some of you may know Denise, um, recently retired from the University of Northern Iowa, presented that uh, with our building administrators here a few weeks ago. Um, very end of September, I believe. Enhance and refine common quality secondary course experiences for students by aligning essential standards and common assessments. Professional learning at the beginning of the year uh, and ongoing Friday morning meetings to be aligned with essential standards assessment and instruction. So the standards are provided by the state and how do we ensure that if you take Algebra 2 at either of the high schools with any of the teachers, you're learning the same material because Algebra 2 is Algebra 2 and you need to have some common uh, themes there. And so what is it that we're doing to ensure that there's a sort of a quality control piece there, if you will, um, with that. Uh, at school level, instructional coaches are working with collaborative learning communities of teachers to analyze formative assessment data in order to improve instruction. So once we have these common assessments, what are the assessments telling us? Where are students doing well? Where are some areas that we can do better? And so how are we working with the teachers of Algebra 2 to stick with that? Say, okay, here's a, com uh, a concept that students aren't doing well across the district. And so what is it that we need to do with a, from a lesson stand plan, lesson planning standpoint or teaching standpoint to help those uh, students do better? Uh, Blueprint courses were launched in Canvas for all secondary students featuring standardized navigation and ca um, consistent design. So if, how does a student navigate Canvas, um, which is the platform they utilize on their computer, and so how do we standardize it so <laughs> it's not specific to a certain teacher so that a te it's just easier for our students or parents who are helping their students navigate that so it doesn't look different from every class. Uh, Master Connect assessment platform with common assessments has been launched. Um, in English language art science courses with Canvas, so kind of more of what I was saying earlier. Provide ongoing professional development for digital resource tools to enhance instruction. So as we've gone to more technology heavy um, access, so with, with the one-to-one -one at the middle school and the high school and lots of technology in the elementary school but not one-to-one, -one, how are we using that effectively? You know, it does, just can't become the, na the next sort of uh, it has to be an effect. It can be a very effective tool when used right. So, how are we making sure that that's happening? Um, implement the new Achieve system to enhance educational experiences for students eligible for special education services. Um, you'll see that that one is a blue uh, limited progress with that, and that's really being held up at the state level. Um, there are some trainings that were supposed to happen, and I think are scheduled now. And Brenda's not in the room, but they're they're scheduled to make some of this transition happen in the next few months, but we thought we'd be further along, but, um, uh, well, actually, it's right there. Each district in the state, in collaboration with their EA, will determine the launch date between April 15th and September 
15th of 2022. So that's been pushed back a little bit. All right. We are number 18. Uh, deliver intensive professional development and coaching to support staff in the design and delivery of specially designed instruction for students with significant disabilities and preschool students eligible for special education services. So again, it's about making sure that our students who have uh, additional learning needs, um, who learn differently or uniquely have staff who are prepared to deliver that instructional uh, in the way that works best for those students. So. Collaboration, whenever you're talking about a special education um, initiative, it almost always includes the Keystone AEA, uh, who by, um, by charter or mandate uh, really oversees special education delivery for students around the state. Uh, during the first part of this year, work was focused on specially designed instruction in the areas of literacy and communication for preschoolers in collaboration with Keystone AEA, a team consisting of staff from Audubon, Irving, Prescott, and district officer focusing on embedding skill instruction throughout the preschool day. Okay. Other schools are not involved in that? Study? So they, they will be. This is uh, sort of the pilot, and then oh, okay. we'll bring everybody on board with that. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. And number 19, enhance efforts to diversify staff with uh, that mirrors the Dubuque community through uh, review of future job descriptions, interview questions, and recruitment efforts. Recruit efforts continue to be focused on areas seeing the greatest labor shortages, especially substitutes, bus drivers, paraprofessionals, and food service workers. Um, I think you'll be seeing something at your next meeting or in the, in the soon about our substitute um, para pay. Um, we are struggling to get um, substitutes in the para world, and so while it normally is a yearly piece, we maybe see some recommendations from human resources about increasing that early in an attempt to get, just like we did with the substitute teachers, mm -hmm. substitute paras, sub, anything that's a substitute um, is a significant crunch for us. Um, district joined HBCU careers to share job postings and attend upcoming job fairs with students graduating from the nation's historically black colleges and universities. Uh, advocacy efforts are underway with the district level and urban education network to encourage the state board of education examiners to remove barriers for licensure. Um, it's been an ongoing frustration that a teacher, an administrator, anybody coming from out of the state of Iowa has a significant barrier to get a license. So if you can move from Iowa, I mean from Wisconsin to Illinois to a lot of different states pretty seamlessly, but if you were coming from a border state to Iowa, there's a lag time there. And oftentimes, the candidates will then take another job in a different state because they are, a lot of times, especially if they're younger, want, looking for that first job, they're going to jump on uh, something quickly as opposed to take a risk. So how do we quickly and efficiently make sure that teachers uh, who are of high quality uh, or administrators, anybody who has to be licensed through the state can move into the state of Iowa efficiently and not have to continue to look for jobs elsewhere? while they wait for us to figure out how that's gonna happen in Iowa. Um, six district paraprofessionals are currently participating in a Grow Your Own Education program through the University of Dubuque Life program. So those are uh, employees who are working as paras who will become teachers for us uh, in the not so distant future. So it's a great opportunity for them and a great opportunity for us, people who start um, and realize, hey, I'm ready to take the next step and become a, a licensed teacher and let's, uh, how do we support that? So um, six isn't, you know, it's the first cohort and we'd like to see that number grow uh, over time. We have uh, a huge teacher shortage coming at us. I can't overstate that enough. We have a cliff coming when it comes to our ability to hire teachers and administrators. Um, the example I often use, when I started 18 years ago, we had a second grade opening at a, an elementary school, we would get hundreds of applications. This year we had a second grade opening and we had zero applications for the first month of the school year. So their teacher education programs are down 40% nationally uh, and I was not immune to that. So our ability to staff schools in the five to 10 year range, we, we will set that by what we do now to grow our own, to encourage our young people to think about being teachers, to create a work environment 
um, where teachers want to work. You know, we're hearing a lot about stress and, and just the, how education has changed significantly. So what are we do, doing to make sure that's a career that is rewarding and in, in, invites the best and the brightest to be teachers? This is a, I think this is a very exciting new program. We're going to have to do this kind of yep. stuff. Absolutely. As you're saying. Uh, Absolutely. Well, yeah, I didn't mean to editorialize too much, but I, they, they're, oh. they're, of the, all the things that I can spend my time sort of worried about, teacher shortage is at the top of that list. Yeah. And it will be coming very fast. Um, and then enhanced financial incentives were added to support the hiring of substitute teachers in the district to ensure open positions filled daily. So Amy came and spoke with you about that. So that's similar to what we're looking at with the substitute for paraprofessionals and substitutes in other areas as well because mm -hmm. we've got uh, the, wor the country, maybe the world, I don't yep. know for sure, but the country has a worker shortage. Yep. And we better be competitive or people are going to make other choices. The, the salaries around the city, around the county, around the state have jumped dramatically. We don't have that same opportunity to increase things because of the way we're funded through the state. We can do some small things, but um, we can't raise the price of whatever it is that we would be selling in order to afford to pay our uh, employees more the way some other businesses can, and they're certainly outrunning us very quickly. So usually this is a little bit longer, but as we get later in the year, this will be longer as there's more things to report. So this was sort of the, the October 1st run through, uh, which is usually 45 or 50 minutes, and that will be much longer by the time we get to May. Well, I think it's a good uh, reminder for all of us and anybody watching that while it seems the focus has only been on one thing, that the school board has only been focused upon, no. this is the real reason why we're here, right. is because we need... We're here to educate kids, and that's yeah. what the focus needs to continue to be on. And this is a good reminder for us all that you guys are up there doing it every single day, and um, teachers are in there, and this is what's happening, and I think it's great. I think it's, um, I know it's still taking, the, the other issues are still taking up a lot of your time, but I really do appreciate getting these updates, especially this year, to show us yeah. that. You know, we're here to educate kids and ki keep kids moving forward, and we're doing that. A lot of moving parts. There are. Yep. There are. There's a lot expected of all of our teachers and administrators, and I appreciate that. Are there any other questions for the superintendent on this? I think he did a good job of... Yep. Try to talk fast. You did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> no, I think we... I think I can speak for all of us when I say we do appreciate these, these updates, and especially yes. when we're looking for ways to partner with the community. I had a, a tour of a company, AY McDonald's, and I believe I sent you an email. Well, right now, all you have to be is 18 years old, and they will give you a, an opportunity to work there. And it's like, well, let's, let's find ways to continue to work with the Vertex program and the school district. And the, I'm pretty sure there's already things going on, mm -hmm. but it's just a reminder, there's a lot of opportunities when we communicate with the community on a specific goal, so I appreciate you guys constantly asking the community to play a role in our kids' education. You know, I think we've seen a significant philosophical switch. There was a time when schools pushed uh, as many students as possible to think about four-year yeah. schools, and that's still the right destination for a lot of our kids, but there are also a lot of great careers that take a two-year um, through NICC or a different community college or that can be attained going directly into the workforce through an apprenticeship program or for an employer who's willing to train you on additional skills. So it is really the focus to say, you know, you get to decide what your future is, right? You're the student, you're the family, you get to say, hey, this is where my skills are, where my passion is, and we will help find a way to give you exposure and a, and a foot into that. And it's not the, everybody has to, you know, think about the next step educationally. Certainly, again, some kids that's absolutely the right thing, but for others it's not. And so how do we make sure they've got exposure enough to know where they might want to at least start their future? Great. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.